Welcome everybody to our 10th uh, uh, anniversary professorial lecture series. Uh, this is the third one of the events, the last one before Christmas, and we're delighted that everybody can come. So uh, a very busy week, so thank you for coming. Um, we're proudly celebrating our 10th anniversary uh, over the course of uh, this and, and next year. <coughs> really important, I think, that we uh, get the message out there that we are uh, a young, uh, vibrant university with all the characteristics of youth, uh, so uh, most appropriate to celebrate our 10th anniversary, but also steeped in the history of delivering higher education with over 150 years worth of experience. And that is captured best by this kind of activity where we celebrate research and scholarly activity amongst our community and it's great to see so many people come from different walks of life to hear uh, interesting uh, and informative uh, presentations which I'm sure uh, we will get tonight. Um, it's particularly important for us, we have renewed emphasis with regard to our uh, research and innovation. Um, we're putting uh, great efforts into that with the development this year of a new research and innovation office which is already um, bearing uh, great fruits in terms of external uh, opportunities and we rely on our profes professoriate to lead in terms of the development of that research and innovation and the application of one to the other. So this is a very appropriate series for us celebrating our 10th anniversary and celebrating and the development of our research and innovation. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, John to you tonight. You can see by his title that John is going to take us on a journey through uh, his uh, career, his passion. Uh, he has no doubt mentioned to many of you that he believes in this sort of higher level skills opportunity and that there are different ways to achieving those higher level skills and that's something that fits very very well within our university because we do have people studying here from a range of different backgrounds, often coming from non-traditional routes into higher education, and we are able to cater for all of those. And we want people to be able to undertake HND, HNC, foundation degree, and then progress uh, right the way through to complete PhD, should they uh, so want to. So I think it's, it's most appropriate that John is going to sort of explore that kind of journey. And he's going to, to, to do that by also focusing on some of the work that he did with Propellers. Now, our last uh, lecture, uh, was about um, the Fender bass guitar and our colleague brought a prop, he brought a Fender bass guitar with him and I'm just a bit disappointed that John hasn't actually brought a propeller with him but, but he said no prop in this particular uh, presentation. So John's career is an interesting one. He started out working for, is it Tainbridge propellers? Teambridge. Teambridge as a mechanical <laughs> engineering apprentice casting propellers before progressing to university or higher education and ultimately completing a PhD in marine technology, <coughs> which led John then to take up tenure at uh, Plymouth University, uh, where he uh, lectured in engineering, uh, undertook research and supervised a number of PhDs, and published in excess of 60 conference and journal papers, two of which uh, gained awards. And that was a great start for John, but he then left the university system uh, to pursue interest in the higher level skills agenda really and moved to the Learning and Skills Council and from there he joined the National Apprenticeship Service uh, and that's where he really was able to sort of uh, put in place uh, his passion and belief for the non-traditional routes and, and the progression opportunities through from apprenticeships into higher education and beyond. John most recently joined our university, been here uh, over two years, nearly three years Yeah, now. nearly three. Yeah. Time goes yeah. very, very quickly. And he's now Provost of the Warsash Maritime Academy, as well as uh, acting as Interim Director of the School of Maritime Science and Engineering. And that is an area that is uh, very, very important to the university, an area that is very, very distinctive and one that we see growing uh, in the years to come. Externally, very, very active. John is a trustee of the IMRS and a member of the RNLI Technical Committee and Council. And in 2010, John was appointed as one of only 22 associates to be recognized by the Engineering Council. So he's going to take us through, I think, a fascinating uh, uh, discussion about the journey that he's taken, which reflects the journey that he wants to promote for students and reflects very well 
on the work that the university does generally and specifically in the area of maritime. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor John Chadwick. Thank you. I feel the only way is down, but uh, <laughs> I think in the introduction you said young, dynamic and characteristic of youth early on, and I thought that was about me. I thought you were going to stop then. That would have been a good place to stop. Um, yeah, a lot of thought went into this uh, title. <laughs> really, I was thinking about the diverse career that I've you know, actually had, and also um, perhaps, and I, I will be slightly, Jane's used to be doing this, bias in the view of the apprenticeship vocational route, which I think a number of you would be disappointed if I didn't take that, uh, uh, that view. But it's really just to question ourselves as well, because I would say I'm not I'm passionate about apprenticeships. What I'm more passionate about is we get the right advice and guidance to young people in schools to pursue the correct option for them. That's really what I'm passionate about. But our pendulum has, has swung over, uh, you know, the sort of present generation that the only route is A-levels and a degree. So that's what I'm passionate about, the right thing for the right individual at the right time. Um, I've put this slide up and I'll just dwell on it for a moment as well because I also feel, you know, we tend to value the degree perhaps more than the ultimate end point. And what do I mean by that? Well, really, my degree and my PhD my PhD there after my name, means very little when I have Chartered Engineer and Fellow of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology, because that's my licence to practice, that's my competence. You know, if you want to design a propeller or do a certain project for the MOD or sign it off, you have to be a Chartered Engineer. It doesn't say you need a degree or a PhD, but you have to be a Chartered Engineer. So I think in engineering, we have to start thinking about those routes to the end point and the different ways that they can actually be undertaken. So this, yeah, this was a bit of a play. Engineering education, that is what I'm passionate about. Moulding our people, I started my apprenticeship in a foundry, as you'll see in a moment, and propelling them towards their future, yeah, it's because it's about propellers. So a bit of a play on words uh, in the title. It's going to be a presentation of uh, two halves, quite distinctly different. No apologies uh, for that. But initially, it's going to be about my vocational education. I got a bit of a, by saying tractor, I'm going to start talking Devon, so I've got to get in there. You know, it's all about the tractor. I'll start talking about farms, so uh, my, my Devon twang will come out in doing that. Uh, it's not really all about the tractor, but it was the only link I could think before, between my first slide and a slide halfway through. And engineering education, it's the professional recognition that matters. So they're the two uh, aspects that I'll be looking at uh, this evening. And I did start just thinking, we're, we're bandying around the word vocational. You know, a lot of documentation in that you see, it talks about vocational education and training. You know, it's like magically we'll put the word vocational in front of education and training and it will change all our th thought processes and it will solve everything. But I just, you know, what is vocational? What is vocational education? Well, it, it's something, it's educational training that's directed at a particular occupation and its skills. This university does that anyway, you know, in what it does. It's not, you know, it's not new, it's not new thinking, it's just the word that we actually use. Because I tend to think if you're doing good engineering education, you're actually directing it at the occupation and its skills. So for me, you know, it's not, it's not nothing, it's, it's, it's not new at all, okay? It's just how we use it and what we do. So, you know, an engineering education in my mind has to be vocational to create a good rounded engineer. So what got me into engineering? I suppose that's, you know, where it kind of starts because I talked about the right, you know, advice and guidance to uh, young people and, you know, what perhaps gets them to it. And I think, you know, I, I think we as a generation, you know, teachers, peers, perhaps we don't value engineering in the way that we used to. 
I often, I don't know this for sure, but I was quoted once, there was a survey with young people about the most famous engineer for them, their favourite or most famous engineer. Yeah, it wasn't Brunel, it wasn't even Dyson, which I think might come up now. It was Kevin Webster. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to admit to watching Coronation Street, but a mechanic <laughs> on Coronation Street. This is a number of years ago, I'm going back about 15 years ago, but that was an actual survey to young people. Now, that's a shame, isn't it? You know, there, there's a real problem uh, in that thinking. So, what got me interested? Well, I was lucky. It's all about the tractor. That's the first one. Okay. Actually, I'm quite pleased with that photograph because I thought my hairline was receding, but if you look, it's very similar. Okay, so it's, uh, it's all right. Um, health and safety is a bit of a problem there. It's not only the fact the tractor hasn't got a row bar, I'm, I'm not even wearing toe detectors. Yeah, I just don't know what the problem is. But I was lucky. You know, I was brought up on a farm, and literally from the age of one, I was crawling around in whatever you do on farms. And, and you know, but so, very fortunate. I accept that on the edge of Dartmoor. That's Haytor, you know, in the background. And, and I suppose, inevitably, I was going to do something with my hands. You know, that was, that was perhaps kind of a given. And the other reason was probably my brother. And I can embarrass him now. But um, he was always, I always looked up to my brother, and he was always, well, to be honest, he was more mechanically minded than I was. Because as we grew up and on the farm, we, uh, we took up motocross. I put these photographs in for Keith. <laughs> um, I'm the one with the Suzuki uh, shirt, about 14 there. But uh, what was fantastic, in particular, my bike, my bike there, because I had to work for it, uh, during the holidays and various things, and it was a wreck. When I got that bike, it was an absolute wreck. And because of my brother, we actually rebuilt that bike from the ground up, completely rebuilt it. And at that time, probably, it was probably the trickiest looking RM125S, Keith, just for details, uh, sort of out there. But that was, you know, that was getting into it. But it was my brother that really, you know, sort of did that. And um, again, it's, it seems like pictures of the farmyard and that progressed to when we were a bit older and, um, yeah, we were racing a bit more seriously then and, uh, and even had a little bit of semi-sponsorship uh, from the dealer. So I feel very fortunate to have been brought up like that, which I suppose to a certain extent shaped my destiny. You know, the reason was, okay, engineering apprenticeship. I suppose there was never any doubt in my mind that's what I was going to do. My brother's four years older than me, and you know he did it, and it just kind of seemed that I would do it. Because uh, I certainly wasn't going to be a farmer. That's a rubbish job. <laughs> I, wouldn't, my, I think my grandparents were absolutely amazing being farmers. But uh, no, that wasn't. I just used to like racing the bikes around the fields, not actually doing the farming. Um, so, yeah, when I left school, good advert for Teambridge Propellers, um, but... I went to Teambridge Repellers, who are still in existence um, after a sort of selling the company and then the original directors buying it back. They're now the largest manufacturer of leisure propellers and stone gear in, in Europe, uh, based at Newton Abbott. Um, those, just as, as an aside, those are the original Brunel railway sheds at Newton Abbott, where the atmospheric railway used to start and go up to Exeter, um, just as an aside. <laughs> but now... I think Brunel would be quite pleased to think that at least the sheds are actually being used uh, for something in the marine world, particularly as and propellers, particularly the SS Great Britain was the first uh, ship with the screw propeller to go across the Atlantic. So I think there's some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, it seems right, seems right somehow. Now, the apprenticeship, everyone talks about how good apprenticeships used to be, you know, in the day. I think that's slightly unfair. Doing an apprenticeship with a company like TeamBridge is fantastic because you have got everything from a design office you know, to the foundry. And you get to sample that during, in that case, you know, it used to be four years for what we would have called, in old speak, the, uh, the technician apprentice. And um, I often quote, you know, I spent the first six months in the foundry. I admire anyone who works in the foundry. 
Again, not a job that I chose to do long term. But six months working in the foundry, I probably learnt more about people and teamwork than I've ever learnt since. You know, when, to be honest, I can't think of a better way to put it, uh, and it was all men back then, they were a bunch of animals in the foundry. But when you've got one and a half tonnes of molten metal to actually pour and, you know, create the propeller, they come together as a team in such a professional way that you can only experience it. You know, you can't be taught it. So there is no doubt about, you know, the vocational side of, of experience that. Uh, you know, I've never come across any way that could teach teamwork the same as putting someone in a foundry for six months and actually casting, you know, that metal. The, the whole teamwork, the whole professionalism is absolutely incredible. And, yeah, I started doing the, uh, the rubbish jobs, you know, and actually as you do as the apprentice. And I, have no, I look back on it as, as four years that were absolutely you know, incredible doing it. And I went through from the foundry and the machine shop, fabrication shop, it, you know, right the way through uh, to the design office. And that's, you know, ultimately what I found myself uh, doing. And it's quite funny how, <laughs> yeah, particularly the propeller, how things go around. You know, I'm with Teambridge, and there they are, you know, with the propeller doing leisure commercial super yachts. Here I am at Southampton Solent University. If you'd have told me when I was 20, that I'd be a professor at Southampton Sonic University, Warsash Maritime Academy, you know, in marine related, I'd have said, you know, don't be silly. So, you know, it's just incredible how things actually work. And the only thing that's really changed with Team Bridge is, is <coughs> the amounts of uh, metal they can cast in one go. Hence, now they, they are manufacturing, you know, larger P brackets, larger propellers, because what governs the size of Generally, what you can do in the marine world with the propellers or the P-brackets is actually the amount of metal that you can, uh, you can cast. So, uh, so it was fantastic. And what I would say is that engineering apprenticeships are as good now as they were then. Uh, Graham introduced, you know, I spent time as a director of the National Apprenticeship Service. You know, it's still the four years to do what we would have called the old technician apprentice or the level three now. You know, Rolls-Royce still value them, BAE systems still value them, Airbus still value them. They are as good as they've always been. They're different because things do evolve, but they are, you know, they are as good as they've ever been. The issue that I always have in selling apprenticeships is the fact that I left that company when I was 21 to go and do a degree. So the question I always get is, well, why particularly for SMEs, why am I going to invest in an apprenticeship when they're going to leave me after they finish their training? Well, what if you don't invest in apprenticeships? You're not going to address the skills needed by your business, and also not everyone's going to leave you anyway. But if you invest in that person and you leave on good terms, as <coughs> I did, <coughs> I went back to work with them for a short while after my degree. I went on to university. I did... Uh, research project on surface piercing propellers and I need an industry industry partner. Who do you think the industry <coughs> partner were getting European funding? It was Teambridge Propellers. And we've kept in touch, you know, throughout. And in that way, you know, we've fostered a relationship. So, yeah, don't be afraid of not taking an apprentice, you know, if you're worried about they'll leave your company. You know, if you don't invest the skill, in skills, people will leave your company anyway. Um, I put in lots of photographs, actually, mainly from Mike. Where's Mike gone? Because Mike said, yeah, Mike said, oh, I hope there's going to be propellers in it. So there's a few, Mike. You missed one or two in the uh, early ones. Um, I'm going slightly out of order of my career now, but after the apprenticeship, I, I did a degree, and um, then uh, Plymouth offered me the opportunity to do a PhD, which wasn't on propellers, but I'll come back to that. But I wanted to stick with the propeller theme. Um, during my research career, I've basically done two research projects uh, on propellers. Uh, one was on surface piercing uh, propellers. Surface piercing propellers are propellers that are actually half in and half out of the water, given away kind of by the name. They're actually designed really for vessels that, um, this is where Graham, uh, sorry, not Graham, <coughs> Grant, <laughs> sorry Graham, Grant's sitting behind you. Grant will disagree with me, but are in excess of 50 knots before you start benefiting uh, from surface piercing propellers. And the big advantage is having a surface piercing propeller only half in the water you're keeping all the appendages out of the water. So you've got no A bracket or P bracket, you've got no shaft, they're all out of the water. So although the propeller is less efficient 
than a submerged propeller, the overall propulsive efficiency of the system, because you haven't got all the drag caused by the shaft or the brackets, the overall propulsive efficiency is more. So they're more suitable for vessels when you're uh, going in excess of 50 knots. The research project, you'll see another slide in a moment, but was to do with transient loads. You know, if you've got this half in and half out the water, as it comes out the water and goes back in again, there were system failures with surface piercing propellers. And it was actually looking, well, actually, can we model the transient loads and can you, in, you, know, can you improve the shafting system, bearing system, etc., to stop <coughs> failures? The other uh, project was on composite propellers. Um, what we were doing with composite propellers was really actually seeing if they could be uh, manufactured cost-effectively. That's, that's primarily what we were doing. That's not just all you should do with composite propellers because the beauty with a composite propeller is that if you align the fibres of a composite propeller in a certain way, then the blade can flex in a controlled way. So rather than with a bronze propeller where it's actually fixed, if you do a composite propeller in the right way, it has a certain amount of flex that can increase your efficiency uh, envelope. And that's where a lot of the research actually is now. But I have to be honest and say the majority of props are still um, of a suitable bronze uh, material. But, you know, we did this. We were proving it's cost-effective. And actually, one of the interesting things is, was actually modelling... Uh, the resin flow through the sort of dry fibres and predicting that and making sure you didn't have any dry uh, patches, etc., etc. But um, so that was an interesting one. That's actually for those who are interested. That's on, actually on an Aquastar um, 30. What the Aquastar 38, I think, something like that. And we did various uh, things with uh, the composite propeller. These are only 12-inch propellers, only small. This was on just a small workboat. But again, it was really to look at uh, uh, how robust they were, you know, how they operated, and indeed if they could be made uh, inexpensively. And we did actually find, to be honest, all we had to do, although you've got to make a permanent mould, but if you're, if you're greater than about five, you're actually, it was cheaper with a, a composite propeller. That is a problem, actually, because a lot of, unless you're on production boats, a lot of propellers are actually um, uh, designed, you know, specifically as a one-off, and, and that's a problem. You would never get composite propellers to be as cheap as casting a bronze in a sand mould. You, you would just never do it. And just to show the, the sort of characteristics, this wasn't actually trying, we weren't trying to control it in any way, but if you see the bronze propeller, and you see, the, in this case, the quasi-isotropic, um, uh, layup prop number four, you'll see that the efficiency envelope, you know, has actually sort of changed. Um, be nice for a student project to actually take this a bit further and actually start, you know, flexing uh, in our tank uh, in a controlled way. So, yeah, possibly a student project there. And the surface piercing one, and Jonathan will like this. So Jonathan, you'll be going home on this one. This is the cavitation tunnel at uh, Hasler. And you can see what we were doing is we were looking at the transient forces that we'd actually measured and were inputting into an FE model that was then looking at the overall design of the system. But a problem we had is no one really has done actually many uh, tests with surface piercing propellers. And the problem we, we had, we went to um, one of my heroes, someone called um, uh, Ian Damned, who did a lot of work on ship manoeuvring <coughs> in the early days, but he's very, very impressive uh, naval architect. And um, he was working at Hasler, and he said, well, why don't we use the cavitation tunnel? The problem with using a cavitation tunnel is normally the tunnel has water from top to bottom going through it. To test the surface piercing propeller, we needed a free surface. So we had to basically we had to take the top off of the cavitation tunnel and create a free service, uh, surface and a rig then to actually measure uh, the forces on that rig. That sounds very easy, and Jonathan will like this, because he'll perhaps remember this, but down below is an office in Ian Dan's office, and if you stop the cavitation tunnel too quickly, it used to build up a wave that used to come out over the top of the cavitation tunnel and flood uh, the office below. So we only did it twice, but when you're doing that to your hero <laughs> in naval architecture, it wasn't ideal. What's interesting in doing 
some research uh, for this presentation tonight. Um, I was looking at citations of the various papers that had actually been done on this work. And someone, you think, oh, why didn't we do this? Someone's actually taken the work we did on the composite propeller and the surface piercing propeller and actually are using the data to look at a composite surface piercing propeller. And they're actually citing the work and the PhDs that were actually done you know, on that. So from a technology transfer point of view, they beat me to it. But um, yeah, I was treating them completely separately. They've actually put them together. So that was my propeller research, Mike. I've, I've put that in to make sure there was some uh, propeller research. But going back to my own um, uh, PhD, bearing in mind I come back to vocation, I like practical things. You'll notice that the two propeller ones were very practical <coughs> in what I do. I was given a PhD to do. I, I, I say given because um, it was an EPSRC funded project and it's all laid out what you had to do. Uh, even involved Malik actually from uh, uh, when Malik was up, up here as a partner in this as well. But I was looking at an adaptable mathematical model for integrated navigation systems. My first sort of thinking in this is, right, phew, it's mathematical. How can I make this as practical as possible uh, in what we had to do? Um, but in essence, yeah, there was some modelling that, that had to be done. But it was really creating, it says a mathematical model for integrated navigation systems. That's partly true, but it was also for ship simulation. So we moved on a lot. Bear in mind, this research was done between 89 and 94. But it was really creating an adaptable model that you could put into a ship simulator to uh, predict ship manoeuvring. Yes, yeah, so you could just put in the principal dimensions on an adaptable model and whoop, that's how it will actually uh, behave. Partially successful, wasn't it, Malik? Partially yeah. successful. But, um, um, but what I then did, you know, I was doing this and... Actually, most of this was done on a BBC Basic, which is quite interesting. And I think, I think in the end, I advanced onto an Acorn Archimedes, <laughs> which were brilliant, actually, the old Acorn Archimedes. But, um, but of course, I thought, right, I'll concentrate on the propeller modelling, <laughs> getting back to the propellers. And I did, actually. We did a, I, I did a whole section on the propellers looking at uh, the effect of what we call the paddle wheel effect. You know, basically, if you have a propeller... Uh, you don't go in a straight line if you have a single propeller. You get the paddle wheel effect. You get a turning uh, moment. So I spent a lot of time predicting that. And for those of you that remember Manadon, the Royal Naval Engineering College, I used a towing tank at Royal Naval Engineering College, uh, which they built uh, in about 89, and they knocked it down in about 95, was it? So, um, yeah, which was a great shame. Not as good as the towing tank we have here, though. It was a, it was a lot smaller. And... Then the rest of my time to get the vocational element and the practical bits I spent doing sea trials. Uh, so again, for the Wars Ash crew, I can say I've been to sea, not much, okay, sure, shoreside marine engineer, I accept that, but actually there are probably many people that would choose not to go to sea on the sand skewer. <laughs> um, she was a converted um, dredger and basically did uh, coasting around, uh, around mainly the UK but also Europe. And I spent a lot of time in the Irish Sea, going from Liverpool to Dundalk, uh, doing turning circles, zigzag manoeuvres, etc., to validate uh, the mathematical model that was actually uh, being uh, produced. Yeah, she wasn't, um, she wasn't the best vessel, if I could put it that way. But, um, but extremely lucky that you know, the owners agreed to allow us to actually use the vessel to undertake the trials, because that is a problem with a lot of research that's undertaken, is actually validating you know, those results. We can all do mathematical modelling, but you've got to be in a position to validate those models, otherwise they're not worth the paper they're printed on. And, Malik, you'll have seen loads of these, but this is what it was all about. Now, if some of you are actually looking at the numbers on here and thinking, crikey, San Skew had a huge turning circle, <coughs> that's actually for the SO Osaka. <laughs> it's not for the sand skewer. Um, so basically, w when I was validating the mathematical model, um, I was doing it on a range of vessels. The SO Osaka, which is a huge tanker that I can't remember the length of. Can you, Malik? The SO Osaka? 300 about 300 metres. Yep, yeah, so you had that extreme. Then you had, uh, we had sand skewer, which was about 70 metres ish. And then we had the picket boat, which was about. 12 metres. So, you know, real extreme trying to validate the model. And what we've actually got, we had the, 
we got the actual. We had the modular model, which is a, a, a very detailed model that uh, you have to undertake various tests to get the parameters for that model. And then we had the adaptable model, which is the one that I produced, which was to try and get you know, near enough for ship simulators just by putting in the principal dimensions of the vessel. So, yeah, you'll say, obviously, it's not quite as good as the modular model. Well, the modular model took, as I say, tank tests, manoeuvring, etc., to get uh, all the bits. You know, you couldn't use it for prediction. But the adaptable model was purely put in by putting in the principal dimensions and various coefficients of the vessel. Um, and, you know, people think about the turning circle. It's not only the turning circle. In actual fact, you know, you, your speed reduces as you go into the turning circle. So it's actually modelling that as well. But to actually go on for the final bit of the PhD, um, it's about, and, and this now links to the research work we are doing at Warsash on collision avoidance. Because up until that time, basically for collision avoidance, you were putting in a simple arc. You, your prediction, you say it's about that. But in actual fact, that wasn't true because really uh, the ship's master wants to manoeuvre the vessel as little as possible off track. A um, number of reasons for doing that, cost, a you know, number of things. You just don't want to be moving off. So, you know, if you look, if you then put into this, um, uh, uh, this was an um, automatic collision avoidance system we were working on, um, you can see that if you'd use a simple arc and no speed reduction, you end up at point 0.3 there. If you actually use the mathematical model, you end up there. So you can see that there was a use for it within integrated navigation systems. So that was the PhD. Um, that then led on to, once I got the PhD, then to some funded um, uh, research. And the first uh, work was actually on the Hammerhead Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. The Hammerhead actually was a, a low-cost research vessel that had been purchased by Cranfield University. And uh, we actually linked up with Cranfield to develop an integrated navigation guidance and control for the vehicle. It was a £400,000 EPSRC uh, project. So what's the Hammerhead AUV? Well, it was low cost because it was basically given to Cranfield. But it was originally, and Nigel, you might remember these. Um, so I'm not being unkind to you because of the date. Sorry. <laughs> um, it was originally a deep mobile target. It used to go off for target practice for frigates, etc. Um, but anyway, we rescued that and we basically put a PC inside there and used it as an early autonomous underwater vehicle. This was about 96, so you know it's 20 years ago nearly when we were, we were doing this. So yeah, please bear in mind things have moved on a lot, but this, you know, these were very early days. And this is a great image actually because we used to do a lot of our trials at Roadford Reservoir in Devon. There's a dam. Just up here is a restaurant with people sitting outside. The, the faces of horror when they actually saw a torpedo going towards the <coughs> dam was actually, uh, yeah, I wish I'd filmed it at the time, but um, there were some uh, interesting uh, people watching that. Um, but that's what it was. It's three and a half metres long, very slow speed, one and a half to two and a half knots, would go to 100 metres. That's the design in theory. We never did that uh, because, again, we had to do this early days in controlled water. We couldn't do that at Road for Reservoir. We could go to about four metres. If you went below that, you started catching the trees because it's a relatively new reservoir and the things are actually flooded and we would have actually lost uh, the device. Um, and again, we had very limited, the transverse water current limit, you know, if we'd have actually taken out the sea, we would have struggled quite a lot, so we weren't doing that. Um, the idea, the research, was actually about um, designing something that would follow a cable, inspect a cable, <coughs> come up, do a GPS fix, go back down again. That's what it was actually uh, doing. This was a work of Cran... We did the control and guidance. Cranfield actually developed the laser. And you can see there are various uh, pictures, you know, actually doing this. But what it was really doing was actually uh, getting a laser, you know, to actually follow that. So it's quite a simple thing, but actually would have been very cheap 
at that time. I mean, this has moved on, but a way of, of uh, monitoring and inspecting you know, pipelines in particular in the, in the North Sea. Because at that time, there was no other way to do it other than using divers. Um, just a uh, detail here, but what w our part of the research was really, you know, you have a desired heading and we had to do uh, controlling guidance. In particular, this, I think, Malik, was on the fuzzy logic work that we actually did, you know, to actually try and get uh, on that uh, desired heading. And you've got the rudder deflections, you know, in doing that, which is not, you know, again, this is a time again, that's not optimal, really. There's a lot of uh, rudder deflections uh, going on there. But um, as I say, early days. And... Just another one here showing um, uh, the heading and the rudder deflections to actually achieve uh, that heading. We then moved on to what I think is, was probably my most enjoyable research project uh, with, and I must mention, Professor Bob Sutton, who is a colleague of mine at Plymouth, and we worked together you know, on, a, on a lot of his. He, he was a mentor uh, to me, uh, actually. He's uh, just retired now, uh, but... Um, it was absolutely fantastic to work with. And the Springer actually came up as a title of this unmanned surface vehicle because he had Springer dogs. And the Springers are sniffers, and the idea of the unmanned surface vehicle, this one, is it was actually to, to look at pollutants and aspects like that. So, we, OK, we'll call it Springer. So this time, it's an unmanned surface vehicle used for multidisciplinary research, as you can see there. But primarily, pollutant tracking, Environmental hydrographic surveys in rivers, reservoirs, etc. It was interesting. This is one of the work that won, um, uh, we got the best paper in the Royal Institute of Navigation. We went to the Geographical Society to pick up our award, and it was presented to us by the Duke of Edinburgh, who's a character for those of you who met him, Paul, and a couple of times. And we walked up to get it, and he went to shake my hand. He said, Well, pollutant track. So you know, know your way to the you know your way to the toilet, do you? And that's like, what do you say? So, <laughs> yeah, it's like yes, sir. You know, it's like, <laughs> but um, yeah. But equally important secondary role is that Springer can use the test platform for other academic and scientific institutions. So indeed, perhaps as we develop our research, you know, we could look at um, you know, perhaps even utilising Springer on the lake you know, in, in a controlled environment to look at our collision avoidance and various things that we might be doing. Grant, this is where you're not allowed to take the mickey out of me. This is the only boat that I've designed and built in my work in Korea, okay? It's a MWATH, medium water plane area twin hull vessel. We wanted, it couldn't be a small water plane area twin hull because they're too dependent on the load, as you know. So we designed them WATH, okay? And, um, sorry, clicker. There we go. And there it is, designed and built. You're impressed, aren't you, Grant? It's great, John, it's very red. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite color. Um, but what we're doing here, one of the innovative things, it seems, on, on this, to make it a real flexible test bed, actually, is, is these penny cases were amazing. We just so simple, we, we struck them on, everything's in there, your PC or whatever, you, you, you plug in and you go and do your trials. It, it was absolutely so simple. And I come back then to the vocational education and training, the practical side of, of you know, what you do. That you know, early on it was, oh, are we gonna get computers and how are we gonna keep them dry and put them all inside? And this was, no, we're just gonna get one of these penny cases and you just put them on and just plug it in. It was absolutely fantastic, even if I say so myself. <laughs> and there you go. So you take the pelly cases off, and we can uh, we can get to the leak sensors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Put that down. Strap your pelly case on onto onto these. Plug it in. Off you go. Back at Roadford again. And what I want to show you. Just one minute long. But. Yeah, we're doing this research now, but obviously the technology's changed. This was, it's not collision avoidance, but this is actually trying to uh, track between waypoints where there's obviously external influence here. You can see it's quite a windy day, so it has to adapt actually, you know, what it's doing. This next one, it, it, you can see it trying to correct itself. It just misses, it doesn't go through the hulls, but it 
manages to hit the waypoint. See it trying to correct? Miss. <laughs> Good sea keeper in there, crap. And just going into the last one. And what's delightful, where I think I certainly get a kick out of things as well, is the PhD student on this, Wasif Nayan, now works at Queen's University in Belfast and is now one of our research partners on Maximus, a research project we've got representing Queen's University. That's nice. I think, you know, as you get, get quite a kick out of that. Right, it's all about the tractor. See, if you didn't have a tractor, you couldn't get it out of the lake. <laughs> Very lame, I know. Um, but, uh, yeah, that springer is there, uh, and, well being used for research, but potential to be used for research wider. A couple of other quick ones that I was involved in. Um, we set up a wave energy company, uh, which was a multiple oscillating uh, water column. These are columns of different lengths, going up into a turbine. Different lengths up to actually take into account the sea waves of different frequency, different wavelength. Uh, so as hopefully you've got the turbine turning optimal uh, speed all the time to actually produce power. Uh, it was built, it was put about half a mile outside of the breakwater in Plymouth Sound. Four weeks later it was in bits in Jenny Cliff Bay after one of the worst storms. If you remember in about 99, something like those huge storms. And it was actually a great shame because it's actually the mooring obviously that, that failed and uh, fortunately it didn't hit any vessels coming into Plymouth Sound which would have been a bit of a worry for the university's insurance um, but uh, ended up on Jenny Cliff Bay. But did result again on positive things. The researcher that was doing this went on to set up Orcon and actually set up his own uh, wave energy company and is now a, uh, a director with another huge uh, wave energy uh, company. And the final one, this makes you think about technology transfer and what you do. You think, okay, I've gone to wine. Wine fermentation in process quality monitoring system. Took into account state of the art research, basically developing a computer assisted system to survey the fermentation process. And when you have the right technology transfer, you know, we've got to think about this, <coughs> that's when the way that we actually do it. We came in, you know, we were control engineering, mechanics, and electronics. We weren't, we didn't have winemaking experience, or I can't pronounce that. Onology is it? It's onology, isn't it? It's called, I think. Yeah. And, uh, but you can see, if you get an interesting topic, uh, all the European partners we have, this was funded to the tune, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but over, over half a million uh, euros to introduce the wine fermentation process. And what we did is we actually created multi-sensor day fusion subsystem um, to then actually feedback through a display for a human operator what needed to be done. Did you need to add more sugar? Did you need to do whatever to actually improve the wine? Could have been fully automated. Absolutely no way will any vineyard, they, they, you know, it's a secret you know, as to what they actually do. So in actual fact, although this system you know, got a lot of money from Europe, it was never really going to fly because all the vineyards at that time wanted to you know, do their own. And the trouble is, at the end of the day, we, we had to do a lot of research on this, and we had a lot of meetings in various vineyards you know, throughout uh, Europe in actually doing this, because we, we agreed there's no better way to, uh, to sample wine. This is Bob Sutton, by the way, just here. I can consider my mentor. What I want to do now, just for three minutes, so that's the end of the research, if you like, of my career, but it's just to now focus back on the engineering. But you'll have seen that really my research has been very vocational, but very applied. Um, so let's take that back to the education. So this is a, a three-minute video from the Engineering Council. Engineering is everywhere. Bridges, power stations, oil rigs, shipping, and aircraft are all traditional examples of engineering that serve us daily. 
But engineering is so much more than this. It plays an essential role in every aspect of our life. Engineering delivers the smartphone you use to wake you up in the morning and catch up on the overnight news. It creates 3D printers, x-ray machines, MRI scanners, and prosthetic limbs. It produces next generation telescopes to help us understand where we came from and develops crop technology to allow us to keep going. There are half a million engineering employers in the UK who contribute to nearly 25% of national turnover. One in six workers is employed by these engineering businesses. There are over 2 million engineers and technicians representing 6% of the UK workforce. Every day, we entrust our health and personal safety to products and applications developed by engineers and technicians. So it is vital to ensure their decisions are based on sound principles and a wide knowledge of practice. The Engineering Council is a regulatory body for the UK engineering profession. We work with 35 engineering institutions that have interests in specific sectors or branches of engineering to set and maintain internationally recognised standards of competence and commitment. We hold a register of just under a quarter of a million professionally registered engineers and technicians. 18% of them reside overseas. Our brand is synonymous with confidence. Confidence in the quality of the knowledge, understanding and skills held by all those who have made a commitment to become professionally registered. Confidence that they are committed to maintaining their competence throughout their careers. For those with aspiration and ambition, we have set out an achievement cycle that reflects professional development pathways that can be followed by all, whether starting out or progressing in their careers. Engineers and technicians acquire knowledge through formal study or workplace learning, which is accredited. Their professional experience can then be appraised and their training and development approved. They then have their competence and commitment assessed and assured by their peers, leading to registration on the National Register. Registration with the Engineering Council provides assurance that engineers and technicians have the knowledge, skills and attitude to meet society's needs with integrity and respect. It's what sets them apart. The Engineering Council. National assurance with global impact. Regulating for you. Just wanted to share that because I think it helped all the words there that you would expect around higher level skills. Just <coughs> contained within that little uh, three minute uh, video clip. But one of the things, the opportunity in engineering education that stands out for me there, it said there are two million engineering technicians. Less than a quarter million are actually registered. And 18% of those quarter million are actually overseas. So, you know, we're not thinking about the end point that I was actually saying of professional recognition. So there's a long way uh, for the engineering council and the professional bodies it represents, i.e. IMRS for, you know, there's a long way to go there and actually to get people to think of engineering as a profession, not just a job. And I think that's the, you know, the big issue that we've actually got. But I think that lent its way into higher level skills, particularly with the, the wheel showing you know, uh, the competence. And um, I was involved with the Engineering Council quite a lot. as uh, one of only 22 associates of the Engineering Council and I sat on the Registration and Standards Committee. So I was involved in writing part of the UK specification. But the government, the last government, actually set out to support the needs of the economy and aspirations of employers to develop work-based you know, higher level skills. That was one of its key strategies. Um, and that's been carried forward, obviously, into this government. Also, a paper published, uh, it was only about four weeks ago, wasn't it? Forging Futures, Jane, can you remember? The UU, uh, Universities UK and um, uh, the UK CES published Forging Futures. And it's still there, you know, being pushed. This, universities' employers need to be innovative, engaged in promoting different and non-traditional routes into higher skill roles. Um, skills development should be a joint enterprise between education and employers, where workplace and vocational learning is part of the cultural norm. All the kind of things, you know, we're actually beginning to say. Um, all the things we know, at a meeting with Vice Chancellor Group this afternoon, are very difficult to fund because we have funding models that actually fund very traditional routes. So it actually makes this very difficult. 
uh, in doing it. Others, a few other lines from various reports, uh, Sea Change in Higher Education plus others. Transformational thinking is needed. The shift away from the historical and conventional instruments for measuring success. Improving the student experience is our number one priority. That's, that's key for the university. It's one of our strategic priorities. And the student experience you know, is behind our vision and mission. What should that be going for? What should it look like? Another quote, interesting. Up to 50% of the undergraduate curriculum will in the future be offered outside the university campus. If we go towards higher apprenticeships, degree apprenticeships, yes, it will be. The Officer Cadet <coughs> Programme at Warsash is probably the optimum higher apprenticeship uh, programme, although we can't call it higher apprenticeships because of the funding models that actually uh, fund that. That's interesting. System of HE will become more pluralistic with blurring of distinctions between public and private providers. You know, we're going to begin to see that now in the future. And indeed, you know, the FE sector has seen this competition for a number of years. And I think what's actually quite interesting <coughs> is this, this bottom one. It's that, in actual fact, the students now sit at the heart of the higher education. They are the ones with the money, in effect, even though it's a loan. They're the ones that are coming along with their £9,000. Or in the potential in the future, with degree apprenticeships, perhaps with industry money. You know, to buy. So this debate around student customers is going to be interesting, you know, in the future. So the government, what did they set out to do in the last government in coming forward here? And that was, this was really my work with the National Apprenticeship Service. But to increase the number of young people starting an apprenticeship. It's quite difficult when you get reports like the Channel 4 Dispatches Programme last week, looking at the failure of the next apprenticeship scheme. And I think that's ultimately because too much power has now gone to the employers. It used to be with the training providers, it's now gone totally to the employers, and it hasn't stopped, you know, in the, in the central place. I don't know what it's like from an FE perspective, Nigel, but that's what it, it feels like. You know, it never stops in the sensible place. So, you know, the big press last week, next apprenticeship system, you know, fails. So they want high-quality apprenticeships. And they want to increase the number of employers, we know this, and to see more advance and higher-level apprentices on the programme. This is now going to partly happen because from 2017 there will be a new apprenticeship levy. I think it's basically, I haven't seen the full details yet, but about half percent of the company's wage bill will be taken as an apprenticeship levy. So then the company will have to set up an apprenticeship scheme to actually uh, get back their half percent or whatever to actually train apprentices. My worry with that is that really the right way of doing it? Is that then going to get companies to take on apprentices to address their skills <coughs> needs for the future? Or is it going to get companies to take on apprentices to get their money back that they're paying into the levy? And then at the end of the apprenticeship, they say, sorry, we haven't got a job for you. <coughs> so that's a very, I think that's a, a, a dilemma. I don't think, personally, that the levy was the right way to go. But it's happened. It's a huge opportunity for training providers be it in the FE sector, be it in the HE sector, because it's also applying to <coughs> degree apprenticeships. Nigel, what I hope it doesn't become is a train-to-gain scenario. We have a huge bubble for a couple of years, and then it goes, and, you know, that will be wrong. So I hope they've learned lessons from train-to-gain in actually looking at the levy for uh, apprenticeship. But what were the desired outcomes? Well, it is about increasing that progression offered to higher-level skills. And about the work-based vocational education route to chartered license, you know, to practice. It might seem odd, you know, even I did the, the, the research you saw, the PhD. I didn't do the normal route to get registered as a chartered engineer. Because if you looked at the time what you needed, before UK spec, which is the specification for engineers, there was something called SARTOR, <laughs> which was the standards and routes to registration. And basically... If you didn't have a master's, you couldn't become registered. There were no alternative routes. Basically, you had to have a master's. So in actual fact, that was catastrophic for the marine side because it actually meant that a seagoing chief engineer couldn't become a chartered engineer. So, you know, it wasn't looking at competence. It actually put the registration base as being an academic qualification rather than competence. So, you know, I think we've overcome that now. If you look at UK spec, it doesn't actually say you need a master's. It says you need a level 7, M level, or equivalent. The 
doesn't actually say you must have an MEng, which it used to under Sartre. Um, but this engage a new cohort of individuals in higher level skills. That's an interesting one. So it's not about competing with our existing student base. Um, the last year I was in the National Apprenticeship Service, we had half a million starts. Only 8% progressed from a level three apprenticeship into higher education. But what they meant by higher education was the traditional degree route. We knew from other research that 50% of those apprentices would like to progress to some kind of higher level skill. But that's not the traditional degree. It might lead to a degree, but preferably in engineering, it would lead to professional recognition. <coughs> so if we look at engineering, I call this a pyramid of attrition. But the majority of apprentices will actually stay at level three. You know, they don't want to necessarily progress. <coughs> my best friend I did my apprenticeship with, he works on the uh, steam engines on the Painting King's rear line. And he now manages the, the workshop there. But that's what he wanted to do. You know, he's really happy crawling inside a boiler of a steam engine. You know, that's exactly what he wanted to do. He didn't want to progress and he wasn't interested in this. But we have to make transparent those routes, how you can do it. So here, these are the engineering registration. You can be an eng tech, you can be an incorporated engineer, or you can be a chartered engineer. And what we should be talking is, we've got the perfect vehicle to do it, not whether you need a degree or whatever, but you, know, you, you, you make the competence, you look at the level that you actually need and how you do that. Basically, level three, as we know, is A-levels. Level six is a bachelor's, level seven is a master's. Um, I don't know of any job that needs a competence of level eight apart from academia with a PhD. You know, it's not related to a profession. I've cheated on this diagram, and the engineers here will know that I'm having a battle with the engineering council at the minute. Or it's not a battle, they agree. There's not much we can do about it. I-Eng is really level six but that makes it too close to chartered engineer. It doesn't actually allow the progression in the way that it should. So I'm working with the engineering council to try and change that. So as you would be eng tech at level three, I eng at level five, and C eng at level seven. So it's important for the profession, the engineering profession, Paul, to get this uh, right, you know, in how we do it. And we are pushing this, the, uh, and the engineering council have uh, actually noted that in doing it. Now, you would think if that was a progression, because what we should do is make all engineering apprentices, when they finish their level three, the old technician apprentice, we should make them automatically registrable as eng tech. Biz are causing problems with that at the minute because of the way uh, assessment works with that. But in theory, you would expect the registrants to be the same as that diagram, wouldn't you? But the trouble is, because we haven't valued engineering as a profession, and sold it in that way, that in actual fact, that's the number of registrants. The pyramid's the wrong way around. In the engineering uh, profession, we've been trying to address this for a number of years, and we will only do that by getting young people, when they undertake their apprenticeship, or early career, uh, to actually value taking on engineering technician, because this pyramid needs to actually be the same as that pyramid. Otherwise, we'll always have the problem <coughs> of it being seen as CNG as an exclusive club rather than a uh, pyramid where you progress throughout your career. We asked professional bodies, I commissioned a bit of research for the National Apprenticeship Service, about where they were of apprenticeships in their sector. This is all sectors, not just engineering. 49% said yes. You think, oh, that's reasonably positive. Pity they didn't say 100%, but 49%, that's okay. We then said, okay, do any of your members currently join your professional body via apprenticeship routes? Only 27%. So you've got nearly 50% aware of them, but only 27% of them allow professional members in with an apprenticeship. It doesn't really encourage people to think of professions as a profession if you 
and you have 27% that will welcome it. And this is the problem. Professional bodies, if you look at that, percentage of respondents whose lowest fully professional membership category requires qualification at each QCS level. The majority of professional bodies want level six, i.e. bachelors, because it's not about the competence, what they want is the bachelor's degree. The blip at level three is fortunately because of the engineering profession with those few engineering te technicians that you actually have. But basically what I'm saying is you can't be considered to be in a profession until you're at level six. For engineering, that's completely wrong and certainly my task working with the Engineering Council and IMRS and in particular Registration and Standards Committee Paul is to actually obviously change this and you know we have to do that. Young people have to think they're in a profession not just a job. So then um, and this is where it got interesting because at this time I was pushing the Minister to introduce higher apprenticeships um, so we went back to the profession and said, OK, if we had higher apprenticeships, would you consider that? And in actual fact then, 70% said yes. So that did, it was John Hayes was the minister at the time, skills minister. At last, with this, he sort of said, yeah, OK. The other reason he wanted to launch higher apprenticeships is because he was on a platform and needed some good news. So we launched higher apprenticeships, <laughs> which... Uh, which was good, but it's certainly been, been trying to do that for a while. So what we can see in this diagram now, this is the old off diagram, I know it's a bit out of date, but I, I like to show it this way, is people generally thought, you know, apprenticeships only went to level three. We can now show them going all the way to level seven. I call it the complete slice because the traditional academic route just does the crust. It can be a very good crust, but it just does the crust. You know, the apprenticeship has to do the competency element as well. You can't, an apprenticeship doesn't do just this bit, an apprenticeship has to do the whole lot. But yet, a degree just does the crust. And that's why I don't like things when they talk about, I, I think, Jane, you and I have had interesting discussions on this, but that's why I think higher apprenticeships shouldn't be called degree apprenticeships because it's making the degree the valued part of the apprenticeship. The degree shouldn't be the valued part of the apprenticeship. That's just part of the journey. And it might not be a full degree. It might not be a degree. It might be a set of modules that a professional body has recognized to allow professional recognition at that level. So we need to put CENG outside here as well, another bit around the outside. Jane and I have had interesting talks on this. We might have another one afterwards over mulled wine. <laughs> so um, that's what level four, that's what higher apprenticeships basically look like. Anything that's being delivered, what we're really talking about is the profession, professional bodies in our case, I'm arrest for a lot of what we do, but under the auspices of the Engineering Council, they define the professional status competency requirements. It's measured within the employer and you're left with that bit in the model that we actually, in the middle that we do in the classroom or somewhere. It's the officer cadet route, is what we're actually looking at uh, there. And Engineering Council, just to go back to this again, the professional registration of the Engineering Council is based on demonstration of competence and commitment, as indeed the higher apprenticeships we've developed at Solent University in the built environment in the retail and in the health areas uh, as well. And indeed, I keep saying the uh, officer cadet as well. But there are three levels in engineering. It's so well placed to look at that developmental model in what we do, you know, as long as we can value uh, engineering technician. And the trouble is a lot of employers don't value engineering technician either. Um, you know, we actually have to do that. Um, Five generic areas of competence and commitment. That's you know, what we're looking at. All the things you would expect to see in a higher apprenticeship. Knowledge, understanding, responsibility management, leadership, etc., professional commitment. All the things you, know, you would expect to see. And it's what we need to do in the design of our higher level skills programme in the future. I'm not going to dwell on that, don't worry. But this is where it gets... It's so easy. 
This is first page from uh, uh, the UK spec. So you have engineer and technician, corporated engineer, chartered engineer, and basically under each of the uh, knowledge, understanding A, you actually put down what you're looking for at each level. It's there. The framework is actually there to do it in engineering. The trouble is, when we were developing UK spec, and there are lots of debates, because incorporating engineer is too close to chartered engineer, the wordplay gets a bit, you know, when you're designing the level, which is quite difficult. It's not in the middle, and that's the problem. And, you know, we've shot ourselves in the foot at the moment, and we have to, we have to overcome that uh, in the future. So we've got a perfect design tool there to do it. And one other thing I want to say on the design of higher level skills as well and higher apprenticeships, and I think this is key because I do think the government have got this wrong at the moment and the employers, is that there should be no prescribed time period for the development of competence and commitment. At the moment, partly driven by funding, degree apprenticeships tend to have a set start and finish time, which worries me because... In engineering, you have to be at a certain level to demonstrate the competence and commitment. You might have done your academic part of your higher apprenticeship, but unless you can demonstrate leadership management skills because you're leading a team or whatever, you can't become an incorporated engineer or a chartered engineer. So you might get your technical certificate bit early, but you can't get the whole thing. And I think that's a problem because obviously it's a, it's a problem for funding models as to how you do that. But in engineering, a set time to do higher level skill will not work. So, in conclusion, the way forward is really about targeting access to the professions. I'm talking about engineering. You know, it's young people, it's in schools, it's the right advice and guidance into schools about showing engineering as a profession at whatever level you start, even from you know, the apprenticeship, starting the apprenticeship in the foundry. You know, it would have been great to have got Eng Tech when I'd finished that apprenticeship. I didn't realise engineering was a profession until, you know, a lot later on. I'd just done an apprenticeship in the foundry. Recognition of stopping off points that will allow employers to focus what level their <coughs> skills gaps are. Okay? So you, on that pyramid of attrition, as I call it, you step on and you step off that as your employer requires it or you require it. And again, moreover and visible, the opportunities that have always existed, because they are there for technicians to progress. It's just difficult. It's a minefield, you know, to actually get through that. And we have to actually do that. And finally, I suppose I mentioned my brother. Um, I lost my father a few weeks ago. Um, Hopefully he'd have been proudish. Um, but uh, you always have a father actually supporting you as well. The trouble is with the motorbikes that I showed you at the beginning. You know, they are very dangerous. You should read that warning sticker that's on the tank. And when you actually break both arms and both legs at the same time, then you need a father actually pushing you. But primarily for engineering as well, it wasn't only my brother, but it was my father uh, you know, pushing through you know, sort of from the the farming as well. So again, nice view of Dartmoor in the, in the background. So brother and father, but you know, key people to actually push you on these sort of vocations is extremely important. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>